Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk About House. I'm Todd. I'm Juana. Okay, we're going to talk about the um, housing crisis. It's a, because of a housing shortage. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about how we got into it, what caused it, and how we're going to get out of it, what the next decade is going to look like. Because it'll take over a decade for the, to resolve this. And I'm going to tell you a sneak preview hint has nothing to do with interest rates right now. Do we have a, a crystal ball? Yeah, we don't have. We didn't bring it. Okay. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through this article. This is a lot of information, so please bear with us. Probably a little one of our longer videos, but we'll try to keep it under 15, 20 minutes so that you go, you could. But like I said, this could be a lot of information here. Okay. So this is from an article um, on Realtor.com. The housing shortage hits crisis levels. What home buyers, sellers need to know before making a move. One, if people are trying to figure out what's going on, because right now we have people frozen because they, they're not sure if they should buy investment property, they should buy a house, they should keep renting, they should sell their house, they just don't know what to do. Right, so the answer is different for everybody because every situation is different. I know it's a cop out, but we'll kind of start with some basics and go from there. Okay, first quote from the article. The country is short between 2.3 and 6.5 million housing units according to Realtor.com estimates. This is houses. Right. This does not include apartments. No. So this is um, single family homes that we're talking about, right? So th that's what we need to be focused on. Right. Now, those numbers, we've seen numbers that, of course, this is estimated because um, it, it's the number of homes built minus the number of homes that get destroyed in a year. And then it's also the number of household formations. Mm -hmm. So in general, we have to build one house for every two household formations. Why is that? Um, because we need to put people, because not everybody can, um, can purchase at the same time. We've got apartments, so there are all kinds of other living situations. And then of course, um, you know, sometimes we have other family members who move in with us. We have roommate situations. We have all kinds of things going on. Okay. Uh, okay. So how did we get to this crisis point? The population is more than doubled since 1950. More Americans are living longer and they all need homes, but builders have struggled to ramp construction back up since the Great Recession. Uh, the average in the 50s, the median age was late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. We have people living, especially wealthier people, living much longer. Right. So we have uh, the silent generation is still around. Uh, the baby boomers are healthier. They're living longer. They're living independently. And they are keeping their larger homes. So all of that plays into it. You know, Todd mentioned the, the homes that are destroyed every year. So remember, homes are destroyed by natural disasters, by fires. They, they, don't, uh, they become uninhabitable for a variety of reasons. So those homes are about a quarter of a million homes in the U.S. a year, which is a lot of homes, particularly when we're short, you know, anywhere between a couple million to, to six plus million homes, depending on how you're counting it. Um, the other thing, too, that Juan has said, so you have the silent generation and the boomers. Remember, the boomers aren't really at their end of their life yet. Remember, no. the boomers are born in the like 46. So they're in their 70s. Mm -hmm. The oldest ones are in their 70s. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is if there's two of them, if they're married, you usually have to wait for both of them to go because what's happening is one of them will, pa if somebody passes away, then the other one stays there. And sometimes they live another 10 or 20 years. Or especially you get somebody who married, like remarried, married somebody much younger. And now they're like, oh, I'm, you know, they're not, it, and there's no chance this house is just going to get like inherited by people, by heirs. Right. So nationally, we're looking at about 12% of homes that are listed that are uh, in connection with somebody having passed away. So most homes are going to be homes that you and I own, right? That, uh, that they're going to be sold. You know, we do also have some inventory coming on from um, people who maybe purchased Airbnbs and uh, the, the local authorities uh, have decided to uh, do away with Airbnbs. So that, that, that's another source of listings. And then, of course, we have people who during the pandemic purchased second homes or vacation homes because they thought that they could work from home forever. And now that employers are saying, hey, you have to come back to the office, maybe they're noticing that they're not able to use that second home or vacation home as much as they used to. So some of those are being put on the market. But by and large, we're looking at uh, still a significant shortage of inventory to address the number of households that require a home and 
new household formations. Okay, the housing shortage is a problem that developed over the housing crisis a decade ago. This started a decade ago, actually more than a decade ago. It's probably going to take a decade to get out of it. Says Mark Zandi, the chief economy at Moody's. Okay, Juana, this is a problem with home builders. Right. So home builders lost a lot of their labor pool after the Great Recession, or during and after the Great Recession, right? Because so many um, people that were in construction were laid off. And when they were laid off, of course, they had to still make a living. So they found other careers. Those careers uh, are careers that they have continued in. They have not gone back to construction. And they are not going back to construction. So that leaves this uh, this need for more labor. The other thing is, of course, there is the issue of materials and uh, finishes and that sort of thing that there's a shortage of and they're becoming more expensive. And the number one thing is not maybe something that you expected. It's um, regulation. NIMBYs. Right. So it's, uh, you know, different areas as far as permitting and making it super expensive. I mean, by some estimates, uh, half of the cost of a home is regulatory. Yeah. That's a lot. So We've got you, numbers that so, are going to blow you away. Right. So, so when you're looking, let's say, at a $400,000 home, if nearly $200,000 of that is regulatory, that gives you an idea that it doesn't really matter what happens as far as maybe material costs or even labor. As so long as that regulatory cost is going to be fixed, that's not going anywhere. We know the regulatory costs only go up, not down. Uh, they're not uh, they're not subject to market forces you know that lets you know that uh, housing is not necessarily uh, it's not easy it's not easy for housing to come down in price with such a, a, a significant portion of the cost being regulatory uh, builders have struggled to ramp up as about half of all construction companies went out of business during the Great Recession mm -hmm. as home building ground to a halt according to National Association of Home Builders Many skilled laborers found jobs in other industries. Here's the next one. This is really shocking. There was a roughly 80% drop in new construction from the peak in the third quarter of 2005 to the trough in the first quarter of 2009. Okay, now imagine this. Imagine if the airlines had been wiped, 80% of the airlines had been wiped out during the pandemic and they had just retired a bunch of pilots early and parked a bunch of planes and then everything came back right? Airfare would just skyrocket supply and demand. There would be like, yeah, everyone wants to go on vacation, but we don't remember airlines were trying to survive and they did. A lot of airlines retired airplanes and early retired pilots and they just shrank their business. And then the problem is, is then air travel came back and they're like, oh shoot, we need to buy more planes. But the only two air manufacturers, Boeing and Airbus making these planes can't make them fast enough. They have their own supply chain problems. <laughs> Boeing and Airbus are both behind on deliveries. And then the airlines are trying to hire and staff and do the whole thing. So now that's, and that was only like a 15% drop. So now think of home building and think of 80% of all new home building going go away and taking a decade and being short. That's where, that's where the shortage came from. Right. And the shortage is not something that's going to be uh, ameliorated quickly. It's going to take a decade or okay. more. <laughs> okay. Here's the next quote. If the population is going to grow and the pace of home building is insufficient for that growth, there's going to be a housing shortage, says Robert Dietz, chief economist at National Association of Home Builders. You have to be building more than 1.1 million homes a year meaning to meaningfully reduce the deficit. Here's the problem. Even that's not going to fix the deficit. We have 330 million people in the U.S. Mm -hmm. right now. By a little after 2040, mm -hmm. we're going to have 400 million. Well, just so stop for a moment. So he just said that that they're trying to put up 1.1 million homes a year, right? right? But we just talked about a quarter of a million homes a year being destroyed or being uh, rendered uninhabitable. Yep. So now we're down to about, what, like 800,000 and change? And we're adding two to three million people a year. We still have a growing birth rate. We mm -hmm. still have immigration. Right. We don't, we're not, we just don't, it's supply and demand. Right. And we're actually still negative, meaning every year going forward, we have less homes uh, available. Now think about this. You go to the store and there's a whole ton of eggs. You just go buy one. 
you pay the price and you don't think about it. And then you come back and there's half as many eggs, but you're like, hey, there's half as many, but I'll still take one. And then you come back the next day and there's a quarter and you're like, oh, there's very few eggs and they're marked up a little bit. Well, I'll take one, you go home. The next day you come back, there's no eggs. <laughs> And you go, hey, where are the eggs? They go, well, we don't have any. I have to go to the other store. You go to the other store and they just have a couple and they're really expensive. What do you do? You fork over the money because you need the eggs. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what's happened with houses right now. Right. And, you know, there are lots of markets where uh, that we still have bidding wars. We still have um, home selling over list price. We still have all of that going on. And it's not because these homes are particularly spectacular. It's that these homes are nice and there's very little inventory so if the home is nice and there's very little inventory people are just kind of holding their nose and pay, paying the money uh today says deets the industry is suffering from lack of construction labor a lack of available lots lack of lumber and building materials a lack of lending to builders and developers and local laws zoning requirements adding to the costs builders incur so it'll be interesting to see if um at some point, the government gets involved and makes um, creates some sort of program for builders to help them put up more homes. Um, I know that I'm not a huge fan of government involvement, but I do see that government does tend to get involved when the market isn't um, isn't up to what the the public needs. Yeah, that would be the worst thing possible. All the government should do is provide more incentives. If well, the government tries to build homes, it's they, they... No, I'm not suggesting the government build homes. What I'm suggesting oh, yeah. is that the government set up programs to loan money to the builders to put up homes. Yeah. That's what I'm suggesting. I think that's only part of the, solves part of the problem because they still have to get the labor and the resources and the well, but it doesn't permits. Solve, like, it, it doesn't solve the regulatory problem, which is also also creates delays and uh, and a significant cost burden for home building. And then the other thing, too, to think is this. Like, you're in Vegas. You want to add more homes. Well, we can kind of do that. But what if you're in San Diego? Like... Where do you put them? It's already fully developed. You have to go really far out. And then people are like, well, I work downtown. I don't want to live, you know, you know, 20 miles east of El Cajon. You know, I, I want to be closer in. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, then they got to get water out there. And then now you have to have the water company has to be in on it. The sewer company has to be in on it. The, the, you, someone's got to build a road out there. Like, it's very complex, okay? Right. Here's this one to me is the most important part of this. In this post-COVID-19 world, the cost to put up a new home is 30 to 40 percent more than it was in 2018 and 2019. Okay, Juana, mm -hmm. people out there that complain, come on the channel and complain about affordability, mm -hmm. they want the builder to eat the cost of, they want to pay what they paid in 2018 and 19, but then they... The, the builder's gonna, not just going to pay 30 or 40 percent more and eat it. They're going to well, the, raise they, their price. They can't eat it because there's nothing to eat. Yeah, didn't we figure that, out the that, profit margins only? That, like, that is a cost to them. 15 percent or something. No, it's it, not, was, it was less than that. It was, yeah, it was uh, under 10 percent. It was like nine point something. Yeah, it's not substantial. No. They're not making a killing. No, they're not. So, I mean, yeah, so there, there, there's a lot more to it. So that's that's kind of what we wanted to illustrate here is what's involved in this so you get a better sense of how we got here and where we are, keep going. In addition, the nation loses between 100,000 and 250,000 homes every year. According to NAHB, they're mm -hmm. torn down, destroyed by natural disasters or fires, or just deemed no longer habitable. Some of these cases, they don't, they don't, either the local city or whatever doesn't let them rebuild there for whatever reason. Um, also, remember, some of these are just, hey, we're gonna put it in a park, we're gonna put it in a freeway. Mm -hmm. Uh, they did this in LA. They've done it in Vegas. If you ever drive down uh, 95, but like from the Spaghetti Bowl downtown and go up like to the Northwest, mm -hmm. it's really wide. There used to be houses on both sides of that. And they had to literally buy neighborhoods and take out whole streets mm -hmm. on either side of the freeway. And they literally bought the people out. Uh, I had friends that lived in one of the houses. The house isn't there anymore. When right. I was a kid, I'd go to his house and now it's gone. You go to you go to go down that street. It ends. You can't get to the street where it used to be because they had to expand the freeway. So it's called eminent domain, and uh, I know that for some of us, that those are dirty words. Maybe we'll do another video another time. But that is eminent domain. Higher mortgage rates are worsening the housing crisis. Higher mortgage rates, which the Federal Reserve hoped would cool the housing market, have actually wound up worsening America's real estate crisis. So the idea was rates would get really high. There would be more sellers, no one would be buying. 
that inventory would build up. You had to have inventory build up to have a housing crash because now you have people competing, trying to sell their house. They compete by lowering their price, right, Wanda? Right. That's what happened in 2006. Mm -hmm. Like in Vegas, we got we had 26,000 houses in the MLS. And that's when we said, hey, look, this is, this is going to end poorly. And, uh, and it did. But we have the opposite happening here. We, in Vegas, we have 2,200 houses. Mm -hmm. We have like less than 10%. And the other thing is, it's a much bigger city now. Mm -hmm. So we would have to have 40,000 houses on the market. So obviously, what the Fed tried to do, the opposite happened. Well, right. I mean, the, the Fed tried to use interest rates as one of the few tools that it actually has to get inflation under control. And, and that has worked to a large extent. But it, the unintended consequence is the virtual freezing of the real estate market as far as uh, causing sellers to not put their homes on the market. Now, you know, I, I did bring up that there are sellers, of course, bringing their homes on the market, but it, it a lot fewer sellers than we would normally have. Uh, the problem is most homeowners with mortgages either purchased or refinanced into lower rates during the pandemic. If they put their homes on the market to move into new homes, they risk taking on higher rates than seven percent, resulting in substantially larger monthly mortgage payments. So many are choosing to stay put for longer including some owners who would have been likely to downsize. The other problem is, want it? Mm -hmm. Some people are just saying, forget it. I'm just going to, like the people with cash and the investors mm -hmm. are still out there. Mm -hmm. So what they're not selling anything, they're just acquiring more. Right. And they're like exacerbating the problem. Well, and then the other thing that's happening, of course, people are, um, are doing more renovations in order to make themselves comfortable in the home that, that they're in rather than getting a new home. And we've talked about that too because we are seeing more renovations uh, happening. If you drive through neighborhoods, uh, it's not uncommon to see the here in Vegas, they're blue, they're these big blue pans and you see them and they're full of um, basically, you know, people's kitchens, bathrooms, whatever. And they're putting in new stuff and they're keeping the existing shell and making the, um, making the inside brand new. And what does that make the price of value of the house do? So that's interesting. So depending on what you're doing with the house, uh, that may substantially increase the value of the house. So let's say that you're maybe putting in a new kitchen or a new bathroom that you're going to do really well with. Uh, if you're redoing your living room or your den or bedrooms, that won't do a whole lot. Uh, swimming pools are kind of a uh, kind of a loss because swimming pools tend to be a lot more expensive than what you get out of them. But of course. Uh, swimming pools are something that a lot of people enjoy here in Las Vegas, particularly in the summer. So it's worth for, worth it for their quality of life. So it depends on what improvement you're doing as to what your um, how that affects your resale value, whether it improves it substantially or not. Very few home improvements, if any, will you get dollar for dollar. So meaning, if you spend you know fifty thousand dollars in your kitchen. I don't know that you're going to get fifty thousand dollars more for the house. I mean, you'll get more for the house, but probably not all fifty thousand. So, whatever improvement you do, make sure that you're doing it for yourself to enjoy, uh, and whatever extra you get for the house uh, due to that improvement, that's just bonus time. In addition, investor sales of single-family homes spiked during the pandemic. They have been purchasing about a quarter of single-family homes on the market since mid 2021. Investor sales have remained strong despite higher mortgage rates. As many of these buyers, ranging from mom and pop flippers to large corporations looking for homes they can rent out, pay in cash, they're 100%, mm -hmm. they don't care about interest rates. They're trying to park cash because their cash is being deflated away. Mm -hmm. And they, if they park it in real estate, they're banking on appreciation for the real estate mm -hmm. and then rents. They could just take, they can collect the rent and then their cash is protected in the house. Right. You know, uh, everybody tries to diversify their portfolio, so they're not just going to just put their cash in the stock market. Uh, they are going to also put it in real estate. And you know, what's interesting is that the real estate that they're purchasing is um, toward the bottom of of the price um, of the price scale, which means that they're competing with the people that are very sensitive to affordability as far as being able to qualify for loans and. Uh, being sensitive to interest rates, but these people are not sensitive to any of that because they're purchasing cash. Right. Uh, the bottom line is that we have a crisis. The crisis is all of the things we mentioned. Mm -hmm. The underlying thing that is driving it is supply. There's not enough homes. Price of homes is strictly a function of the market. So for people who've said, but the market, it's, it's too high. Well, 
the price is what the market has determined it should be. You can't, if there's just too high would assume you're in some disequilibrium. And you could argue that the, that dis, we're in disequilibrium. That's what the crashers are, and doomers are saying. We're in disequilibrium and we get back to equilibrium. When everything goes back to normal, the price will drop. Look, then if new home builders are paying 30 to 4%, 30 to 40% more, then you're probably going to pay 30 to 40% more. And if, and if a new home builder in five years is paying 30 or 40% more than today, you're going to pay 30 or 40% more. Here's the other thing. In Vegas, median home prices are about 450, right? So let's have this discussion, Juana, because you know this sort of uh, scenario very well. When we add units to the housing market, mm -hmm. we have this mid middle price of 450. Mm -hmm. Are we adding new home builders? Are they mostly building houses under 450 or above 450? So they're mostly building above 450 because for the most part, those regulatory costs are very similar between the different price points for the house. So you may as well build a more um, expensive house because then you are likely to have a better profit mar margin. Yeah, there's a lot of, mil I mean, we didn't used to have whole subdivisions where they were million dollar right homes. and what's interesting is that you were having builders that used to be build that used to build um you know we used to call like middle class homes and they're building what we would call luxury homes because they're building million dollar homes some of them have sort of rebranded yes they 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 took all they did was change their name to some other thing because their name was associated with tract homes, they would just crank them out, right? Well, but okay, so this is what, the other thing that's interesting is these million dollar plus homes are tract homes. That's yeah. what's so crazy. Yeah, they're not, they're, for the, to some extent, they're not on a ton, huge lot. No, they're on small lots. As a matter of fact, if you go to the older part of Vegas, which is, you know, I would say within a couple miles of, of I-15 in these older neighborhoods, there's still some massive lots. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then if you go out to the suburbs, really, or really far out toward the mountains, these lots are extremely small. Matter of fact, we, we went in a couple of these where literally you have a very small, small front yard. You have a very small backyard. You don't have a lot of stuff going on the sides because when you go on the side of the house, you have five feet in a wall and then the next house is next to you. Right. But if you go to Rancho Circle or Scotch 80s or McNeil Estates, these, these large luxury homes – are on massive lots where they have huge front yards, huge backyards, the houses aren't touching each other. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean last week I went to see a house and it was it was a million dollar house and uh, literally like there was like no space between the houses left and right. right. The front yard like you took two steps and you were basically at the front door and then the backyard was kind of the same kind of thing and behind the house was a four lane road. And I'm thinking, oh goodness, I don't know that I would spend, you know, over a million dollars on something like this. I mean, it was a cute house, but there was nothing special about it. it right. was, and it was a tract house, and it was by a builder who uh, has made their name by building um, more economical homes. We'll put it that way. Did it start with a K and end with a B? No, it started with an L, actually. Okay. End with an R? Yes. All right. That's, that's it. I didn't have any more data. But I think that pretty much... You know, if you have comments, uh, you know, most of you guys aren't shy about putting stuff in the yeah. comments and what your opinion is. But, you know, I know that there's a lot of people saying, yeah, it's getting ready to crash, but we have a shortage. So, well, so look, uh, we don't know anything about the real estate market crashing. The numbers that we're seeing don't support that theory. And when we do see that, we will share that with you right now. What we're seeing is that we have more demand than we have supply and we're not seeing any pullback. Um, tell us what you're seeing in your market. We're interested in finding out about you. Please remember to like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share the video, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.